So I want to talk mainly about uh, work that's in progress uh, and we've been doing in the last couple of years. And uh, what we're trying to do is to understand human autobiographical memory by building a robot autobiographical memory. And I, I put up this picture by Salvador Dali, not just because it's a fantastic picture, because uh, the persistence of memory, as he called it, is an example of what Dali called a dream photograph. He was trying to paint a scene that he could see inside his, his head. In fact, this is the coastline of Catalonia, where he grew up. So he was essentially trying to paint his episodic memory and also illustrate how time kind of morphs uh, in memory in an interesting way. So we'll come back to this. Um, I'd also like to motivate the talk by uh, describing to you a patient that uh, Endel Tul Tulving, the uh, psychologist who's best known, I think, for his studies of memory. He, he uh, looked at this patient, NN, who had a profound amnesia as a result of a traffic accident. And he found that uh, NN didn't just lose the ability to uh, remember his own past. He also completely lost the ability to imagine his own future. And he described NN and, and other patients have been described as living in a permanent now or being marooned in the present. I know we're often told to live more in the present, but uh, to be actually marooned in the present and not to be able to go back in the past or forward in the future really is a distressing thing. And exploring NN's memory and what faculties were intact and which, what were lost, it was remarkable the kind of dissociations that he found. So NN had a pretty normal digit span of eight. That's the number of uh, numbers you can recall. It's a measure of short-term memory function. But his memory for a picture that he'd seen before was zero. A normal score would be 70%. Uh, he could he didn't, didn't do well in cued recall tests. He showed some priming effects. There's a bunch of things he's good at. You can see that he's good at language, general knowledge skills. He could tell you what's involved with going to a restaurant or with making a phone call. He could tell you about the structure of those kinds of events. And he could tell you about units of time in abstract terms. But he couldn't remember any actual episode from his own personal life. He could tell you stories about himself that, that he'd learned, but they weren't really about him. He didn't have any episodic memory, any autobiographical memory. And when asked to describe what, it, what he would do tomorrow, he said he had the same kind of blankness about the future as he had about the past. In fact, he said, imagining tomorrow was like swimming in the middle of a lake. There's nothing there to hold you up or do anything with. It's a kind of scary prospect. And uh, the filmmaker, Luis Buñol, uh, made a similar reflection about the importance of memory to you have to begin to lose your memory, if only in bits and pieces, to realize that memory is what makes our lives. Life without memory is no life at all. Our memory is our coherence, our reason, our feeling, even our action. Without it, we are nothing. And I think the more I think about the relationship between learning and memory is that uh, these are all memory systems. And uh, you know, we were thinking about uh, the, the role of, of, of development and, and really, uh, it's about building up memories that can help you get through life. So, uh, Andal Tulving is also responsible for the term mental time travel, and he described the capacity of episodic memory and its ability to go forward as backwards as being our own personal form of mental time travel, that we can roam at will into the past and into the future. And of course, uh, NN was not capable of mental time travel, he lost that ability. Other species do seem to have something that's a bit like mental time travel. It's disputed. But this table, which is a behavioral and brain science article, looks at the evidence in different species. There you have primates uh, and then birds and uh, some other mammals. Uh, scrub jays in particular have been studied and perhaps show the strongest, strongest evidence of forms of mental time travel. Uh, scrub jays is uh, studied by uh, Nikki Clayton seem to be able to remember uh, in detail past events, particularly uh, their food storing birds where they might have stored a nut or a worm, when it was stored, uh, and what has been stored. So they can, for example, uh, remember whether they stored a worm or a nut, and if it's a worm, they'll go back for it sooner because they know that it will go off more quickly than if it's a nut. 
So uh, I'm inspired by these, this literature and these findings to think about whether we could build autobiographical memory for a robot. And I think if we could do, we could build robots which were capable of a richer, more natural social interaction. They'd be more useful robots. But I guess my main motivation is also really to understand ourselves by doing this process. And I'm, I'm working on this problem uh, alongside other collaborators in a European project called WYSIWYD. Uh, in particular, we work with IIT. There's several people from IIT here that are linked to this project. And Giorgio Meta, I think, will be speaking tomorrow about uh, some of the work in that project, uh, particularly around uh, the iCub's physical abilities and the iCub's ability to think about its, its physical self. And Peter Domini, who is here and also be speaking tomorrow, will talk about uh, the language capability we're developing for iCub and also about the narrative self. And I think he'll probably also reflect on autobiographical memory. But I want to motivate my talk by uh, uh, initially just explaining to you what we've done in the past with uh, what I call brain-based robots and, and to show you very quickly how that's led to this interest in memory. And then I want to finish off again quickly talking about another fun project we're doing to build a small animal-like robot called Miro. So for the past two decades, we've been working on uh, computational neuroscience models of uh, brain systems. And we chose to focus on sensory motor circuits, particularly the circuits underlying active sensing in mammals, particularly the whisker system of rats. And uh, this is a sort of a very rough model of the different loops within the rat brain that are involved in sensory motor uh, responses to whisker stimuli. And this is one of the control diagrams for a robot that we've built. Again, roughly replicating some of the loops within the rat brain. Uh, we've built a whole lot of different robot platforms to test out these computational neuroscience models. I just want to show you uh, a couple of them. This is Shrewbot. And, and we built this robot in order to have something which was reasonably close to the biology in terms of the sensing apparatus. Obviously, we can't have real whiskers here, and we can't have a whisker follicle. But we can have individual whiskers that move as rat whiskers do, and we can sense bending at the base of the whisker shaft. And we can use those signals uh, to control the movement and exploration of the robot. So we've been building another, a number of these robots. We've been exploring how uh, these robots might sense the world through their whiskers. And we've been asking the question, well, how does uh, a robot or a rat control its attentional focus? How does it know where to look next when it's exploring the world with its whiskers? And this is a, a key question, not just for animals, but for robots. If we don't want our robots to be continually going back to the same place, they need to uh, have attention, and their attention needs to uh, happen across time. And they need to know where they've been in the past. And so we've been building models of tactile spatial attention. And a key aspect of these models is, first of all, we, we think of a, a zone of salience that the animal is trying to explore. In this case, it's trying to explore along walls. It, it, the, the model here sees um, vertical physical objects as salient for exploration. But in order not to go back where you've just been, uh, you have to have some memory. Uh, let me just show you this is a, a physical version of the robot. Here we see uh, my colleague, Ben Mitchinson, and uh, the robot is demonstrating its ability for a soft, gentle touch. Again, it's, it's controlled by a similar model of uh, tactile attention that we developed in simulation. And uh, the robot, although it's not doing anything with the information at the moment, it, it is uh, building up a map of where it's explored previously and using that to decide where to explore next. So crucial to both of these models is to know where you've been in the recent past because uh, the bristle contacts are fairly sparse. Uh, they happen about uh, 10 times a second if you're a rat, slower if you're a robot. And you have to remember where you've sensed before in order not to go back there. So in our model, we actually build up a very literal map of the contacts we've seen before. And we store that. And we use that to inhibit that region of space to ensure that we don't go there again straight away. How does such a system operate in the brain? Well, I think uh, 
in order to understand how animals are exploring and sensing and paying attention, we have to think more about the role of spatial memory because uh, beyond very short-term memory, the animal is going to rely on long-term memory of space in order to know what's been explored, uh, what's, une what's unexplained and unexpected in the world, where it might go next. And of course, a place to look is the hippocampus, and we've had some great talks in the last couple of days about hippocampus. We've been developing our own models of hippocampus, uh, primarily with a goal of, of getting things to work on, on robots. This was uh, a, a model of hippocampus based on the, the concept of a particle filter, uh, which is the notion that you have some estimate of where you are in space, which you update based on incoming information. Um, and we've built particle filter models that operate in our whiskered robot and uh, operate just with touch information. So this is a robot that is uh, using just the contacts on its whiskers. Again, it's, it's Shrewbot, and it's using those whiskered contacts to build up a map of space. This is, these pink dots are where it's estimating uh, objects are in the world, uh, and these traces are where it estimates that it is within the world. It's doing, in effect, what engineers call simultaneous localization and mapping. It's doing it really with a, uh, an engineering approach based on particle filtering. Uh, but I think there are some analogies to what uh, may be going on in the hippocampus, which might be worth exploring. And it, it's proof of principle that you can build a map just, just through touch. And uh, rats, being nocturnal creatures, may do this some of the time. We're working now with uh, Neil Burgess. This was a model that he showed yesterday to take his model uh, of the hippocampus with its play cells, boundary vector cells, head direction cells, and embed, embed that in a new version of our whiskered robot. And the new version of the robot will have uh, vision as well as whiskers so that we can do multimodal uh, models of spatial cognition. But uh, I want to come back now to human autobiographical memory and the work we're doing to try and, and think about this system. So we, we're working on the spatial cognition in our models of the rat and in our rat-like robot. And in the work we're doing in the iCub, we're thinking again about the same system, uh, the hippocampus, as being crucial not just in spatial co uh, cognition, but in event memory and in autobiographical memory. And borrowing from Rubin, this kind of overall general model of uh, autobiographical memory with event memory at its core, and uh, appreciating that again from another patient, HM, very famously had uh, uh, most of his temporal lobe on both sides removed in order to treat epilepsy. And again, he suffered uh, from very profound amnesia, uh, indicating how critical the hippocampal system is for storing uh, event memories. So we're trying to now build in our robot uh, a model of this system. Uh, we're in an early stage. We uh, are are putting together, in effect, the components that will contribute to multimodal memory. And I'm going to explain to you what we've been doing so far. A couple more things to, to know about event memory. Uh, as we learned from NN, if you lose your ability to think about the past, you also lose the ability to imagine what the future is like. And uh, there's recent uh, evidence from uh, brain imaging showing that these same systems are operating whether you're thinking about the past and the future. Uh, there's a lot of overlap, in fact, with what people call the default network. When you're thinking about episodes in the past or imagining or planning what you're doing in the future, you're recruiting many of the same systems. And in autobiographical memory, we also now know that you can distinguish different phases of retrieval, and you can link those with different parts of the brain. For example, uh, there's an early phase uh, which you might associate with the retrieval of a memory where you see activity particularly in hippocampus. And then uh, there's a later phase which is associated with the experience of reliving when you experience activity in areas like visual cortex. And the strength of activity in visual cortex is correlated with how strongly you have an experience of reliving that, that memory. So autobiographical memory is not just about retrieving some memory, it's about recreating and reconstructing it, even in your primary sensory areas. 
So we're operating on a very general hypothesis. It's a bit like uh, Josh in that we are, I guess, bio-inspired rather than deeply biomimetic. We're not building computational neuroscience models of these systems at the moment. We're, we're working on the idea that we can try and replicate the functionality of autobiographical memory uh, with powerful machine learning systems. And from that, we can maybe learn something about how this system might operate in the human brain. So our hypothesis, our general hypothesis, is that episodic or autobiographical memory uh, can be considered as an attractor network operating in what I'll, I'll describe as a latent variable space, uh, which is a space that encodes the salient characteristics of the physical and social world, but it does so in a very efficient way. It, it needs to do a huge amount of compression. So it, it has to compress memories so that they're, they're represented in a very compact way. It also has to be able to fill out memories. It has to do pattern completion. We heard something about that in one of the talks yesterday. It has to take a fragment of a memory and be able to fill out uh, the full memory. And it also has to do pattern separation. It has to uh, distinguish the, the mem two memories that may be quite similar, but perhaps on different days. I mean, maybe you went to the same restaurant for lunch today as you went to yesterday, but you can remember the two events quite separately. Uh, even though there are many similarities. So those three properties, compression, pattern completion, and pattern separation are things that we need to achieve. And what we're doing to test this hypothesis is to build a memory system uh, based on deep learning systems. And our, our general hypothesis is that, that memories would be uh, instantaneous memories, moment, momentary memories or, or um, snapshots from memory would be points in a latent variable space and an episodic memory will be a trajectory through some kind of latent variable space. So I want to explain that, that notion of latent variable space in a moment. Uh, two other hypotheses that we're interested in. One is that we know that episodic uh, memory in, in people operates in two ways. It can operate in a voluntary way where you can deliberately try and recall a particular event. So I can ask you to think about where you went for lunch yesterday and you can pull back the memory of the restaurant you were sitting in, perhaps, who was sitting next to you and what you were talking about. We call that voluntary episodic memory. But perhaps more importantly, and this is maybe something that operates across many species, we, we have an involuntary form of, of auto episodic memory access that in whatever situation you're in, your memory feeds you with information from your past which is relevant for uh, interpreting what's going on now. So as I'm speaking, the things I'm saying might be triggering memories in your mind about perhaps, talk, perhaps past talks you've heard about memory. And that information is useful for you for interpreting the current situation. And the third feature of human memory, as I think I've already implied, is that uh, it's generative. We use our imagination to recreate memories. So it's not just about uh, matching uh, with, with, some, with some memory in the past, sort of classifying, as a lot of neural networks do, it's about regenerating, recreating uh, the event in some, some interesting way. We're using two kinds, we're, we're using a particular kind of deep learning method, which is a little bit different from some of the traditional, not so traditional, they're quite new, sort of convolution deep learning networks that other people are using. Uh, a lot of those networks are supervised learning, so you have to uh, tell, for example, if you're classifying photographs, you have to tell uh, the network what's in the photograph. If it's learning about cats, you have to say whether well, there's a cat or not in that picture. They're largely using big data, so they're collecting very large data sets to train the networks. Uh, and uh, they're learning by hierarchical abstraction. And the networks we are using, which have been, uh, Sheffield University has been a big player in developing these deep Gaussian processes. We can train them through unsupervised or semi-supervised learning. So we don't have to tell the network what to learn necessarily. And I'll give you an example in a minute. Uh, we can work with big data or we can work with small data. And when we're operating with robots and we want them to learn about a particular situation that that robot's in, that's what I would call small data. We want it to learn quickly about, for example, the social environment when it's meeting new people. And they can do, deal with missing values and usefully they can quantify their uncertainty and they can propagate uncertainty so that you can uh, reason about the scene in a way where you know how confident you are about what you're looking at. 
So Gaussian process models uh, operate a very strong form of compression. So this, this, these are, this is a Gaussian process model of some face data. So here are some faces. And what we do when we build a Gaussian process model is we uh, extract uh, some low-dimensional descriptions of the space. So here we're just taking a two-dimensional uh, space and we're using that to uh, represent all the information about these faces. And then we populate that space uh, with what we call anchor points. And then you can use that information to both classify a new input. So if I see one of these faces again, I can classify it based on nearest neighbors. And also I can reconstruct a face by selecting a point here and generating uh, the pixel pattern, which would correspond for, uh, to a face uh, from that position in space. Let me show you an example. So this is work that's uh, ongoing with Andreas Damianu and uh, Neil Lawrence in Sheffield. Uh, so this is, again, a two-dimensional uh, latent variable space for faces. So we're taking very high-dimensional input here. That, actually, this is the reconstruction, but uh, we are taking essentially bit patterns, uh, pixel patterns for faces, and we're reducing them to two dimensions along with these sets of anchor points. And, and what's happening in this video is we're moving around in this latent variable space, and we're reconstructing faces. Uh, and uh, this data was uh, all taken from, from one person's face, but making different facial expressions. So as we move around in this, in this space, we can reconstruct uh, smiles and grimaces and so on. And you can see that there is sort of local clustering within this space uh, of similar facial expressions being near to each other. We can also use this system to generate fantasy memories. So if these are three different faces, again, in a two-dimensional space, then we can, and if this is, is where the original data was for these three faces, we can follow a trajectory through the space. Uh, and this is part of the space that was never populated by original data. And we get a form of morphing between uh, the two faces that we'd seen before. So we're, we're taking the system and we're, we're essentially building the input to our event memory at this stage. So we are solving this problem, I guess, of compression. How can we take very high dimensional multimodal input and use it to create uh, input patterns for learning event memories? And uh, I want to quickly illustrate some of the different uh, modalities that we're able now to represent with this system. I mean, with something like face recognition, we're not trying to compete with sort of uh, uh, Facebook or Google or these uh, companies that are building really high power uh, face recognition systems. What we're trying to do is find a generic architecture which can learn, for instance, about faces, but it also can learn about actions. It could learn about emotions. And we can take the generic architecture and create an event memory system uh, based on that one one architecture, and we can embed it in a robot, and then the robot should hopefully learn in real time about events in its own world. Uh, this is just an illustration of iCub uh, doing face recognition. So this is uh, Andreas, who's developed these algorithms over here. This is Daniel, one of our other uh, researchers. And uh, this is just showing it in real time. That's the, the visual scene. Uh, this is the latent variable space with a number of different faces in it. That's the face that's reconstructed by the network. I mentioned that it's uh, unsupervised learning, or it's semi-supervised, just to explain what that means. So if we learn about a bunch of faces, uh, we can just look at different faces, and then we can create these anchor points for different faces. And then, obviously, once we've done that, we can start to find clusters. So uh, ICUB, having seen some faces, has, has this representation in its network, and it might guess that there are six different people in the space based just on clustering of those points on a sort of nearest neighbor basis. Uh, it could then ask, well, is that right? Are there six people? Uh, a, a, the human operator comes back and says, no, there's just three people, and it can do reclustering and perhaps find these three clusters. And then there are some points which aren't classified, and it could say, okay, what about these memories? Who is that person? And it can use that new information to, to refine the classification that it's able to provide. So this is the, the sort of thing that uh, would be fairly natural for a, a robot-human interaction would be to you know, sort of 
uh, try and recognize people, and if you're not successful, you ask, well, well, who are you? Are you who I think you are? We're also uh, doing speaker recognition, so we're taking auditory signal. We're, we're looking at people talking and uh, classifying them based on the sound of their voice. So a lot of the time, uh, you might just see somebody uh, partly occluded or from behind, but hear their voice and still be able to, to recognize them. And we can do pretty well uh, based on acoustic signals, sort of 80%, 88% accuracy at, at working out who the speaker is. And of course, we can then combine that with the face recognition to give us very good uh, person recognition. And we can also, you, you probably know, know with iCub that it's covered with a sort of tactile surface on its arms, uh, on its body, and on its hands and fingertips. And we can uh, do some various classifications based on touch patterns. In particular, we were interested in social touch, whether something's uh, uh, a, a prod or a soft caress, the kind of signals that we might want to use for uh, social communication. And then we've been doing action recognition. So our, our goal is to be able to piece together uh, person, uh, object, action, triads, if you like, and to build those into our autobiographical memory so that it, if the robot encounters you, it can perhaps m remember the last time it saw you, uh, what you did and on what object. That would be a, a sort of a minimal event memory that we're trying to build. So uh, we've been working on uh, classifying certain kinds of actions. This is uh, Luke, who uh, was, was with the project last year. And you see we were extracting faces and arms and hands from the video feed. And then we're, we're, this is, this, the face obviously is going to our face recognition model and uh, the data from the arms and hands is going to our action recognition model. Um, this is just showing you, uh, I think this is the face recognition model working in real time. There's an action recognition module working here. We're, we're doing actions like push, pull, lift, wave, and so on. I think we're up to about eight uh, actions that you can do on objects on this table. So we want to put time into this. So, so at the moment, we, we're really just taking uh, data streams and we're, uh, we're, we're chunking them. We're, we're picking out bits of data we want to try and classify. And then we're learning about them. But we want to do some kind of sequence encoding or sequence learning. We want to go to the, to rather than looking at points in, in these latent variable spaces, we want to look at trajectories in latent variable spaces as memories. So we're, we're roughly an analog analogizing this to the hippocampus and that we're thinking about the entorhinal cortex as being the place where these compressed sensory streams are converging into the hippocampal system. So the entorhinal cortex is perhaps getting these low dimensional representations of, of who's in the scene, uh, what objects are in the scene, uh, what actions are being performed. Uh, and then it, it seems to be spreading that out, if you like, into a much sparser encoding in an area called the dentate gyrus. And this might be useful for pattern separation, because if the input uh, is similar to, if you have two similar input patterns, you might want to be able to distinguish different events. So if, if, I, if I met Etienne, or Etienne met the iCub on one day, and uh, he was unhappy, and uh, he threw an object, then iCub might remember that. And on another day, he might come in, and he might be happy and you might pick up the same object and do something else with it. And these memories would be similar, but we'd want to be able to separate them. So the dentate gy gy gyrus might be a place where you have sparse encodings in order to take similar patterns in entorhinal cortex and make them more distinct. And then you might, through CA3 uh, and the recurrent uh, connections that that has with other structures in the hippocampus, you might be able to generate sequences. And then you'd want to decode the output from that and you might want to send that back up to sensory areas in the brain. Uh, Neil Burgess mentioned yesterday precuneus as being uh, one of the sites on the path back to the sensory brain where you might be reconstructing uh, or, or regenerating your memory. So we're, we're looking at integrating time into uh, our deep learning networks. And uh, just wanted to show you some initial work on that direction. So uh, this is kind of proof of principle that these kinds of networks can learn temporal sequences. So uh, what's happening here is that uh, we're throwing a bunch of, of frames, a sequence of frames at a, a Gaussian process network. 
This was work that Andreas and, and Neil did and uh, published in 2011. And these green the green frames here are training frames, and the red frames are ones which are generated by the network. So you can see that uh, if you throw it this pattern of the dog walking, it, then it can then sort of take that forward in time and say what would happen next. Uh, this is perhaps a relatively easy uh, one to extrapolate forward in time since it's a, um, a cyclic motion. But we want to take this idea and see if we can uh, push these same kinds of networks to make predictions about sequences which are a bit richer. It's another example of uh, how uh, one of these models can be uh, uh, modulated to have uh, changes in time. So, so what we're doing here is, is the, the model has learned uh, to, act, to actuate the skeleton and make it uh, walk. And then there's a parameter, a control parameter, if you like, which we can vary between different values. And we can uh, swap between two, essentially two attractors for this uh, learned network. So we can go from a walking pattern here to a running pattern. And then we've dropped the parameter down again we can go back to walking. So if you imagine you're, you're generating a memory, perhaps the memory you're generating is, is of some motor pattern, then you can uh, imagine that there are other brain systems which you could say, I want to imagine moving in a different way, and that could modulate how that operates. Uh, this is uh, the same system, but just showing that we can continuously modulate uh, the reconstructed pattern. So if you you scale up the parameter gradually, then you get a speeding up in the, running, in the walking to running pattern, and then you can slow down again. So th these are just illustrations of the, the kinds of things that we're able to do that we might be able to put into our autobiographical memory as it comes together. Um, I want to finish just by uh, returning to Dali and his, uh, uh, his, his, his memories and his uh, painted recollections of scenes. So we'd like to be able to reconstruct uh, the visual scene or the event as understood by the robot. We want to be able to, if you like, look inside the robot's brain and see what it's generating. So we're starting uh, to do that using a sort of simulation engine. We haven't really got simulated physics in it yet, but we're populating it uh, with simulation of the robot, uh, of the table, and then we can start using our uh, memory system to populate it with uh, remembered people and objects and actions. So we're able to so take an avatar and put a reconstructed face on it. This would be from our face memory and then reconstruct an object that, from a memory and then reconstruct the action. So this is, is, is work in progress so that we can reconstruct memories that we've stored and then we can replay them and we can expect them via this mechanism to see what the robot is thinking. So I wanted to quickly finish with uh, another project, which is, uh, uh, harks back to the work I, I started out with, talking about our biomimetic whiskered robots. And we've been building uh, a small sort of companion robot. It, the idea is that it's going to be animal-like. Um, it's going to be loosely biomimetic. And uh, we're, we're building multiple robots, and we're hoping that other people will will adopt this as a platform to develop social cognition for companion robots. So it's, it's called Miro. It has quite a lot of degrees of freedom of movement, uh, particularly for, for, for expression. It's got three different processes. It's got a lot of uh, sensors, sort of two cameras in the eyes, two ears here, uh, and so on. It's got touch sensing in the shell. Um, we are taking our architecture, which we've developed in Shrewbot and in other whiskered robots, and putting a version of that into this robot. So uh, thinking roughly of the brain as, as having three parts, a brain stem, which is largely reflexive, a midbrain, which does some early sensory processing, and the cortex, which does everything else, and putting that into three different processes on board the robot. And you can also uh, run other programs on the robot uh, via Wi-Fi. And uh, we, we've put into the robot uh, a, a fairly basic set of reflexes and uh, uh, attention and action systems modeled on Shrewbot, which is what it's running at the moment. So this is, is the Miro robot as it was uh, last summer at the Living Machines conference. 
And uh, uh, we've built in some basic social behaviors. So it responds uh, to touch. It has sensors on the back of the head uh, by uh, wagging its tail. It has sort of our orienting system uh, for vision now so that it responds particularly to moving objects. And it, it moves towards uh, the things that are moving and also towards things that are making sound. And uh, we're going to take some of the technologies that we've been building on iCub and hope to put them onto this robot. And if you're interested in, in this as a developed platform, uh, please ask me about it later. So just to acknowledge the people who have done a lot of the work here. So that's Andreas and Neil, who have uh, do all the Gaussian process learning systems and are real leaders in that field. This is Ben Mitchinson, who's done most of the work on the uh, programming the whiskered robots and also the mirror robot. And Uriel and Daniel, who have been doing a lot of the work with the iCub and our other collaborators in Sheffield and also Bristol uh, Robotics Lab. Thanks very much. All right, thanks, Tony.